viewers from across the America and around the world. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio. And I thank all of you for taking the time to join us in live broadcast. I'm honored to have as guests with me but this evening both Jessica Aralanes and Dr. Stephen Vision. Jessica, are you there? I'm here. Hi. Okay, excellent. Can you tell people about your radio program and your websites, any contact information you'd like to share and when people can go to listen and catch your show as well? For sure. Uh, I have a YouTube broadcast um, under the title Crossing Over, the name Crossing Over, uh, which is uh, derived from the Hebrew word Ivrit, which means to cross over. And uh, we just kind of started up. Dr. Pigeon is my co-host. Uh, and we have a show on Thursday nights. I think it's uh, 5 p.m. Pacific time on Thursdays. Then we have a really cool show on Fridays called The Good Report. And that broadcasts 3 p.m. Pacific time. And, yeah, that's pretty much it. We talk a lot about a lot. Yeah, a lot of stuff. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. And, Dr. Pigeon, if you would share your information, sir. Who are you and what do you know? <laughs> Dr. Pigeon. I Dr. can't P hear a thing. I can't uh -oh. hear a thing. I'm um, completely blocked out from being able to hear a thing. It's his mind. I think it's his ears, his headset. We might need him to disconnect Dr. from the there, web stream. Can you can hear us? Can can you hear can you hear Zen though? Uh let's see. I hear you, Jessica. There I hear can Zen. Hear me? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, there all right, right. Yeah. great. All right, wonderful. All right, Dr. P, if you would, can you share your contact information and also um, Sephirnet and everything else that you would like to share with the listening audience? You bet. Thanks, Zen. Uh, again, yeah, this appreciate is you. I'm coming from Sephir Publishing Group uh, from our studios in an undisclosed location. So <laughs> undisclosed, I don't even know where it is. I mean, <laughs> I'm lost in a jungle of Sephir Publishing Group. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, you can contact us at sephir.net, C E P H E R.net, and you can reach me at Stephen at sephir.net. And then just contact me and ask me, you know, crazy questions, and I'll see if I can come up with an answer. Awesome. And um, we do appreciate all the work that you bring forth, both of you. And I do want to remind the listening audience that in March 27th through 29th, uh, Dr. Pigeon, myself, and others, my son Justin James Garcia, Dr. Joy Jeffries Pugh, Stephen and Yana Ben Noon, Rob Skiba, Nathan Reynolds, and Gary Wayne will all be attending the Sacred Word Revealed Conference. And that's at sacredwordrevealed.com. If you would like to attend the, the weekend gathering, we'll also be doing a Friday day trip to the Georgia Guidestones. And so if you're interested, please do check out um, the, the website and contact Joy and let us know. And we look forward to meeting and engaging all of you in conversation and possibly sharing meal and dialogue and laughter and memory. And so uh, thank all of you who will be attending. Uh, but this evening, we're going to be speaking about the pagan origins of some of the holidays that uh, mainstream Christianity is involved in, specific this evening to Christmas and uh, whatever else um, both Jessica and Dr. P would like to get into. But uh, Jessica, let me turn it over to you first, and then we'll go to Dr. P for comment on this, and then we'll move into um, some of this topic. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I was sort of hoping, I'm not sure, first and foremost, that if I muted Studio B, I accidentally muted something over here and it says Studio B, so I'm not sure if it's... Uh... Uh, you're good. Oh, good, um, okay. That, that's only for those that are listening live. You're <sighs> in the live stream, so you're good. All right, sounds good. Yeah. So uh, I had wanted to put together a Christmas special. I thought it was important, and for a very long time... You know, have you know, crossing over from the tradition of religion. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Justin says we're good. So crossing over from the traditions of religion coming out of a Pentecostal church, I thought, wow, one of the hardest things that I had to do uh, was to let go of some of the social norms, some of the the traditions that were associated and connected to my faith and Christmas and Easter being uh, two of those elements. And so it was really challenging, especially with my family. You know, my family, the pressure, you have this pressure, this internal and external pressure from society as well as your family. So uh, I have a degree in uh, Christian counseling and I've studied psychology. And so I have um, a perspective that's a little bit different than the, the, you know, the sort of, you know, fear, you you know, you got to fear it to get out of it. And so uh, it's not fear-based transformation. It's more of a, uh, the truth shall set you free. And I think that the more we become aware of what is truth versus tradition, the more empowered we are to make decisions that lead to life. And we know that Yahuwah is life. Yeah. Yes, Dr. P. Well, you know, the, um, the tradition of Christmas, I think, is a very interesting one. You know, one thing that goes unreported in this country, and it's a very important thing, is that for many people, uh, Christmas, the holiday season, is a horrible time of the year. It's not a glorious time of the year. It's not a wonderful time of the year. It's a horrible time of the year. It's uh, replete. I mean, the, you know, the suicides go up. Uh, people are depressed, and they find themselves, uh, you know, at a point where they can't deal with who they are and the holidays remind them of their failures, whether it's a crashing family or a destroyed, uh, uh, destroyed marriage or whatever it may be. But Christmas tends to bring that home. You know, the holidays tend to bring that home and nobody wants to talk about that. And of course the expectation where I think we're going to get into a little bit of this tonight because Jessica has got some stuff on the psychology of this, but the expectation is unending, right? It's like there's not enough Christmas gifts that you should buy. You need mm-hmm. to buy more. I mean, yeah, I don't care how much you spent. Did you get your wife the new Mercedes Benz this year? Yeah. Did, right. she, did she get you a Rolex? I mean, you know, there's there's questions. There's always more money that you could have spent that you didn't spend that makes you something less than the person who did spend it. And so, you know, you have this you have this great uh, kind of um, expectation that is consumerism in the United States that puts a great deal of pressure on people who aren't there uh, to, uh, and they fall through the cracks. Now, that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is, is that we get this reason for the season language that comes from all kinds of party goers. Oh, it's the reason for the season. This is the reason for the season, but it isn't the reason for the season and it never was. And in fact, the true reason for the season, and this is what we get into this big war between the idea of saying Merry Christmas or saying Happy Holy Days, And that somehow it's very important for us to abandon the happy holy day moniker and adopt only the Merry Christ Mass moniker. And there's a reason for that. And I'm going to point that out as we get into this tonight. I'm going to I'm going to demonstrate why this entire feast is the celebration of Germanic, i.e. Roman control over this country. And uh, it's and the obli- the obligations to perform under this particular ceremony are conspicuously Roman. And uh, so, what does that mean for us as a people? That means that we still have the leather tied around our neck. We're still leashed to the Vatican, and uh, we'll we'll see how that plays out here as we get into this. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think this is a, a very important study. Comments, uh, especially for. Can you hear me, Dr. P? Okay, all right. I guess I'll continue. <laughs> no, do- Dr. P, Zen is saying he's it, that it's a very important topic. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. I'm not, there we go. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm not uh, not sure why you're not uh, able to hear me, Dr. P, but I was just saying that, you know, this is an important study for individuals, I believe, especially those that are starting to understand how it was that Christ fulfilled the Levitical feast days and how it is that the Father's feast days point to the coming of the Son as the Passover lamb and how it is through him that we have a forgiveness of sins and that he redeemed us and rectified the fall. And that, um, again, the connection between the Old and the New Testament, even the uh, the Yod-Heh-Vod-Heh pointing to 
the Son, and then the Son, Yah's salvation, pointing to the Father, that we see that there is an, a, a special interconnectedness between the, um, the promise and the coming, the incarnation and the fulfillment, the prophetic fulfillment of Yahushua coming into flesh form and that he indeed fulfilled the first four feasts, and with his second return will Absolutely. fulfill the following three. Yeah, uh, and so, said. yeah, so very important topic. And for those that, you know, don't understand the significance of the Levitical feast days and their connection to the coming uh, and the first and second incarnation, incarnation of Christ, can you speak about that first, Dr. Pigeon, and then we'll go to Jessica. Sure. Well, when we talk about the uh, feast days and how they demonstrate uh, the whole prophetic nature of it, and I've actually talked with many people who claim to be prophets uh, who retain their position inside of, uh, you know, the God-Jesus paradigm. And again, you know, I'm not condemning people who use the name Jesus. You know, the name Jesus is a jurisdictional name that demonstrates, a, you know, Roman Germanic control, uh, which is the source of the name. But when you talk about the realization of the prophecy, if you don't understand the feast days, and if you're not a person who recognizes and maintains Shabbat, however you may understand that, you really have no business calling yourself a prophet. So... Let's talk about this, and let's talk about how this plays out. Because when you see in the opening feast, you know, essentially you have a menorah of feasts, right? So you have, you've got seven candles, and on those seven candles, uh, the middle candle is called the shamash, the servant light. But with those, you can see the seven feasts that are given to us in uh, Leviticus 23 or Vayikra 23 which you have the spring feast, which are, you know, the Pesach or Passover, Matzah, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Bikur, first fruits. And all of those are kind of combined into a feast that some may call Passover or some may call Unleavened Bread. Then in the middle, you have this feast, Shavuot, or Pentecost, which uh, celebrates 50 days after the first Sabbath. And then, of course, you have of uh, the final fall feasts, which is Yom Teru, the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, the Feast of Atonement, and Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles, which is an eight-day feast. Now, when we look at those feasts, what we see is Mashiach came and was the Passover lamb, and so he was prepared for death on the day of preparation, Pesach, and he died before uh, the coming High Shabbat, of matzah. There we go. Here we go. And so we can see a very, very good descriptive right there. And so he was, you know, when we talk about a little leaven, leavening the whole lump, we're talking about sin. And so he was the sinless man. He, rec he, he represents the unleavened bread, the sinless bread. And so he also is this unleavened bread. And finally, his resurrection is the first fruits. And in fact, his resurrection, most believe, occurred just before this feast of first fruits. And so he is the first fruits, the first to rise from the dead. And uh, it represents this first of atonement. Now, when we get to Shavuot, Shavuot is the giving of the Ruach HaKodesh, and in particular, the giving of the Torah. So that uh, Moshe came down from the mountain with the covenant, and he brought the covenant of the ten words uh, to the people, and the people, of course, were uh, engaged in pagan idolatry at the time, and 3,000 died with the bringing of the covenant on Pentecost, or Shavuot. However, it in the upper room, following the resurrection of Mashiach and his ascending into the heavens, we see uh, again on Shavuot, or Pentecost, the giving of the Ruach HaKodesh, like tongues of fire, which brought to us uh, the Torah into our hearts, minds, and souls. In other words, the renewed covenant, the Brit HaDashah, was enacted with the Ruach HaKodesh, pouring it into our heart, minds, and souls. Okay, now we have, we come to the fall feast. Now the fall feasts 
I think were uh, given to us, we still have a wee bit of realization in Mashiach. Why? Because John, the Gospel of John, or Yochanan, Yo, tells us that oh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. Elohim was with the Word in the beginning. And the Word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. Now, those are very key words because the idea of the Logos, the word of, of Elohim, manifesting itself in the flesh, uh, it gives you an idea of this soul incarnation of Yahweh. And so it, it is my belief, and I think the record substantiates it, that he was in fact born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, if you go back and you look at the record, you'll see that John the Baptist was born exactly six months earlier. And if you go back and you look at the year of that birth, it was the year of the death of Herod the Great. Because Herod the Great was apprised of his birth by the Magi and then sent out the order to slaughter all the children in Bethlehem under the year, uh, under two years of age. Well, that occurred in 4 BC uh, because he died in 4 BC following the lunar eclipse, according to Josephus of Flavius, or Josephus as we refer to him. And that particular year, there were two lunar eclipses, both of which were blood moon eclipses. One was on the first day of Matzah, and one was on the first day of Tabernacles. Very interesting. One was the birth of John the Baptist. The other was the birth of Mashiach. With Mashiach's birth, mm. he was then, Mary was in her uncleanness for seven days. And in her uncleanness now, the Magi came to visit her and uh, bestowed the gifts, which were going to be necessary for their flight to Egypt. And she then presented the child on the last great day, or Simchat Torah, it's called the joy of the Torah the eighth day, and she presented the child in the temple uh, with all the conspicuous accoutrements of the Torah. And it was at that presentation of the circumcision that you had Shimon, who was an elder from the tribe of Judah, and Hannah, who was of the tribe of Asher, of the northern kingdom, both testified that he was the consolation of Israel. Now, yes. There's another interesting passage in Isaiah 9 that talks about an interesting tradition that says that the garments rolled in blood would be gathered and used for the fire. Well, in Jerusalem at the time, they used to mark the feast day of tabernacles, or the coming feast of tabernacles, by taking all the linen of the Levite priest that had been used for the slaughter of the animals of sacrifice on Yom Kippur, and they would take those linen and they'd roll them in oil and put them in these burners and then light them as lamps so that people would know the feast was underway. This is said in Isaiah 9. Now, immediately following that, we have the passage that's read, that's written, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Almighty Yah, or El Elyon. The son the one who was given to us would be called the everlasting father, right? That's what it says in Isaiah 9, that the son, the one who was given to us, would be called the everlasting father, right? The prince of peace, the Shar Shalom. So this is why I think the feast days do show his life, and many people believe that the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Atonement will also herald uh, the uh, return of the Son of Man as the yeah. Lion of the House of Judah, because at the sound of the last trump, the 100th Tekiah, if you will, uh, so the dead will rise. Yes, absolutely. Um, Jessica? Excellent. Uh, so we're talking specifically about the differentiation uh, or the differ the difference between Yahuwah's feast and those traditions that have been sort of bombarded and have been coupled in with our culture, right? So we're talking about 
uh, whether they be pagan or not. We're talking about traditions that we have some somewhat assumed to be connected to our faith, right? Christ, uh, Christmas being one of them. I was really hoping Dr. Pigeon would discuss sort of like the history of Chris, Christmas before I got into the psychology of Christmas. Um, sure, I can give you a quick background. On yeah, that too. can you? Because I, I do want to talk about how it impedes upon the soul. Uh, and, and we'll go into the psychology if you don't mind, Zen. Oh, yeah, certainly. Go ahead, Dr. Okay. B. Okay, so when we talk about Christmas, we're talking about a feast that in, in modern culture is associated with the winter solstice. Now, a lot of people may not want to accept this, but it's true. And the idea being that uh, the, the shortest day of the year is December 21st, traditionally. And so those who worship the sun uh, had essentially the mythology that the sun was going to die and was dying, dying, dying. And then on the 21st, it would reach its low point, And then everybody would hold their breath and wait. And they would wait for three days to see if the sun resurrected. And so they would wait the 22nd, the 23rd, and the 24th. And then on the third day when the sun resurrected, then they would have hold a huge feast on the 25th, which was uh, this feast of the solstice. Now, around the solstice, you had many other people that had also created different festivals. For instance, the feast of Adam and Eve, which occurred on the 24th, right? Uh, and there were other feasts. The church, the Catholic church and the Orthodox church, had traditionally, once they established the 25th as the birthday of Mashiach, which, you know, yeah, let's think about this for a minute. If we have this discussion that Mashiach was in the grave for three days and three nights, right, which is what is specified, the sign of Jonah, then what's it doing hanging around with the winter solstice? I thought that took place on, on Pesach. What, why is it hanging around the winter solstice? Okay, so we got some confusion there. Now, in addition to that, then once they declared the 25th to be his birthday, then they had to celebrate the Feast of Circumcision eight days later, because that's what we just discussed with, in accordance with Tabernacles. So January 1st has always been the Feast of Circumcision, and it was the reason that Pope Gregory assigned January 1 as the first day of the year in his, you know, arbitrary imposition of Rome. However, when you go back to the pagan Rome and, you know, pa practicing the Babylonian traditions, the traditions of the Kasdim or the Chaldees, and also the Egyptian tradition, again associated with the winter solstice, there arose this feast that was pagan in nature or heathen really in nature, which was called Saturnalia. And Saturnalia was a um, really, you know, uh, quite a debauchery. And essentially the way they would practice Saturnalia is they practiced it as a seven-day feast. So it would begin three days before the winter solstice, and they would appoint a king of the Saturnalia festival, usually who would be the most deformed individual in town, the one that they picked on all year, ridiculed, kicked to the curb, beat up, bullied, that guy. They would take that person and make him king, and then that person would come in and engage in uh, arbitrary rulemaking, which essentially made meant he would make rules that forced everybody to engage in debauchery at the highest level he could think of, and this would go on for seven days. So it would ha it would happen from the you know the nineteenth, twentieth, twenty first, then the twenty second, twenty third, twenty fourth. Then on the seventh day, the 25th, they would sacrifice this guy. They'd kill him. And oftentimes, it would it would engage in cannibalism thereafter. So a lot of the traditions that came out of that included the burning of the Yule Log, which was a pagan festival, a pagan rite. Uh, they used to run around caroling naked from house to house. The British finally put made everybody put clothes on before they did it. The eating of gingerbread men was to celebrate the cannibalism that would happen on the seventh day. And it went on and on and on. And of course, these rituals of putting up a wreath or a mistletoe or a tree had to do with 
you know, look, let's just say this is a little R-rated, but the Christmas tree had to do with the mythology of Nimrod slash Mithras, the sun god, who uh, Nimrod was uh, the husband of Semiramis, also known as Ishtar, <clears throat> and his cult of Ishtar, Osiris, and uh, or Isis, Osiris, and Horus had to do with this mythology that the husband, Nimrod, was killed. And he was, you know, basically his body was cut up. And there was a particular part that was missing. And somehow Isis found it and managed to get pregnant from it. And so from this severed member, she got pregnant. And then, of course, Tammuz, or Horus, was born. And uh, this was whom is specifically denounced in the book of Jeremiah, uh, Tammuz. Uh, well, so, you know, doc well, you know, Dr. Pigeon, phallic worship was very popular in ancient Near Eastern times, especially amongst the Semitic people, extremely popular. And it actually uh, converted into worshiping poles that they would erect in the groves, such as the Asherah poles, that symbolized even the word rock, which is the word sur, is named after a particular god named Sur, which represented a phallic. And we see that several times, the competition between Elohim, Yahuwah Elohim, being the rock of salvation or the rock, in which he uh, declares he will destroy the sur or the rock of the pagans. And so, yeah. Pagan worship, I mean, phallic symbol, phallic worship was really popular. It was a thing. <laughs> and it still it is. It was a I mean, thing. Yeah, and this is what, yeah, and, and this is part of the reason why the Christmas tree must be cut down. Absolutely. You know I mean? Nobody goes to the, you know, goes to your local gardener and buys a small uh, Norfolk Island pine or a small spruce to bring home in the, you know, in the garden thing where you can plant it out in your front yard later. No, 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 no. All the trees have to be severed. They have to be severed. And that has to be put in your house as a severed member in celebration of this, you know, fertility object right. that would uh, fertilize uh, Isis, you know, right. supernaturally. And in you know, reflection of Isis, who is really the fertility goddess that is celebrated at Easter, you know, that's why they still call it Ishtar, mm. right? Easter, mm. Ishtar. It's very obvious who they're, what the worship is, and but her wreath is yeah. put up, right? Yeah. And so these things are very much, uh, you know, they're very much uh, fertility symbols, and it's the idea of celebrating fertility, not the birth of the Messiah. Right. Right. You know, I think, Zen, the, the history of Christmas trees go way back uh, to the symbolic use of the evergreen in ancient Egypt and Rome, and then it continued on in German tradition. Uh, it was called the candlelit uh, Christmas tree, and it was brought to America in the 1800s. Uh, but prior to that, the Egyptians worshipped a particular god named Ra, who we know uh, having a, as having the head of a hawk and and uh, who wore the sun as a blazing disc in his crown. But anyhow, at the solstice, when Ra began to recover from his illness, so the story goes, the Egyptians would fill their homes with palm rushes, which symbolized uh, the triumph over death, you know, so life prevailing over so, a death. So the concept of resurrection was really embedded in the uh, forecasting of the summer solstice along with the winter solstice. So like Dr. Pigeon had mentioned, that long, tedious time of, of uh, you know, recouping and recovering where nothing would grow in the winter, right? So it symbolized death. It was dark. It got dark sooner. Uh, your activity level was lower. Uh, you know, there was, a, you, you were just, it symbolized death. And so then after winter, Winter comes spring, which again is celebrated with uh, the re resurrection of life, you know, the eggs and the fertility and the rabbits and all these things. So we see that perversion. But again, we also see the mindset of a people who lacked wisdom, right? And so they're interpreting these things as meaningful and powerful influences in their culture. Yes, absolutely. And for those that don't know, there's also mention in Jeremiah 10. Uh, specific to the the pagans you know, decorating Christmas trees, and so this is mentioned in the scriptures. And so, uh, Doctor P, can you comment on that? Yes, and this is something that you know. Again, 
not to give people a lot of grief about their Christmas tree and stuff and their decorations. I know for a lot of people, this is a very hard discussion to have mm -hmm. because uh, there's a lot of people out there that have got years of investment in their Christmas decorations. Right. <laughs> right? right. I mean, I can tell you, I couldn't believe how much room I had in my house when I got rid of my Christmas stuff. I'm uh -huh. like, hey, I don't, I don't have to keep that. I don't even have to keep my storage space anymore. <laughs> right. Right. So yeah. let's see if we can get into that passage in Jeremiah 10, because a lot of people say, well, that's not what it means to me. Right. Right. Uh, right. That, yeah. that's or God knows my heart. Yeah, God knows my heart. And so uh -huh. it means something else to me, right? And it says, okay, so this is in Jeremiah 10. And it, this begins in verse 2. Uh, Thus says Yahweh, learn not the way of the heathen. So this is a feast that's declared to be a heathen feast. Now let's recognize the difference between pagan, which is, you know, from the Latin word paganus, which means, you know, rural guy, right? There's somebody from the country, not from this. He's not a city slicker. He's a pagan. But the heathen is somebody else, somebody who, who has no recognition or belief in the creator. Learn not the way of the heathen and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. Be not dismayed about the coming winter solstice, right? I mean, this is what Jeremiah is telling you. Don't learn the ways of the heathen and don't be dismayed because there's a winter solstice. This is, you know, when you're in the northern hemisphere, you perceive the winter solstice as a time of darkness and death. When you're in the southern hemisphere, guess what? It's the longest day of the year, just the opposite. Mm -hmm. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cuts a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with an ax. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it does not move. They are upright as the palm tree, but they speak not. And they need to be born because they cannot go. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither is it in them to do good. And so you have this idea that they were taking the trees, you know, nail a stand on the bottom. Or maybe you take the tree and you nail it right to the floor. I mean, I'm, right. not, I'm not sure exactly how they would do it. But, you know, you nail it down, and then you deck it with silver and gold, which is the way of the heathen. Why is it the way of the heathen? Because they feared the winter solstice. And so, as a consequence, you're told, don't do this. Don't be dismayed by the coming solstice. And don't practice this business of decking the tree. Now, when we get to the tree, we had a show about this, Zen. Uh, Jessica and I did a show on the, um, the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, I thought that was a very good show, Jessica. But I got to tell you, when we talk about the Roman Empire, this Christmas tree that we see now dominating Western culture was given to us by none other than Martin Luther. Now, I've heard people talk about Savati Svi and the Jacobin Frankists, right? And so they say, well, these guys were all, uh, you know, lawless people who were teaching the abundance of grace by committing sin. But so was Martin Luther, okay? So you can't sit here and point the finger and say, oh, those radical Kabbalists over there, you know, these uh, these uh, uh, followers of Sabbat Tzvi were a bunch of sinners, when so were the Lutherans. And there was, for, for 20 years, Martin Luther taught the doctrine that shall we sin that grace might abound? And the answer for him was yes. And he wrote on this, you know, that it was good to commit rape and murder and anything else you wanted to do, because then you could have something to repent from and grace would abound. So yes. Martin Luther, now he repented of that of, in all fairness, Martin Luther repented of that, but it was only later in his life. And his influence was, he was the first one to put candles on a tree. All right. So this tradition of putting the, the severed tree in the house and then lighting it up, began with Martin Luther in Germany. Now, there's some people who say, oh, well, no. It also had, there was some precedence in, in Latvia or Lithuania or maybe in Austria, but this was Germanic, okay? 
And so what do you see? The tree then came into Britain in 1800. Now, there are some people who say, well, it got there a little earlier than that. But for the most part, the tree did not come into Britain until 1800. And it came to the States in a similar way. It was Hessian communities or German communities that brought the tree with them. So when we talked about this before, when we were talking about the Roman Empire, we talked about how the political and military arm of Rome is no longer Italy or Latin. It's German, and it has been mm. since Charlemagne in 800 AD. Fascinating. Well, uh, yeah, I want to stay focused. However, I just... Uh, Gentlemen, we just received news. This is breaking news. Forgive me, Zen, but it seems that President Trump has been impeached. They voted for impeachment? They did. Well, uh, did. We, we wish you a Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Third president in the U.S. history to be impeached. Sorry for that, but that's obviously breaking news. And you heard it here on Zen mm -hmm. Garcia's channel, right. huh? <laughs> Ooh, Dr. Well, P. Well, you know, wow. the impeachment, I'll tell you, and this impeachment, listen, let's talk about it. It's not off topic. There he goes. There he goes. <laughs> and I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why it's not off topic, okay? The reason it's not off topic is because Ooh. President Trump is being impeached because he has not, he has pulled away from Roman German control, yeah. and he yeah. has given an inordinate amount of control to yeah. Jerusalem, to the nascent yeah. Sanhedrin, and to that camp. Now, as a result, and I don't think he, I don't think he knows that. Maybe he does, but there is, uh, even though he has appointed over a hundred uh, Catholic judges to federal benches, even though he has appointed two. Catholic judges to the U.S. Supreme Court and intends on presenting another one, we see an overt play by people whose loyalty is to the Vatican, i.e. Nancy Pelosi and others, to impeach Trump in order to ensure a greater Roman control over the United States. And, you know, if you go back and you look at the videos of Trump meeting the Pope, you know, the Pope is smiling at uh, Melania, Melania, says, oh, yeah, she's very nice. She's got her veil on and she's obviously, uh, you know, uh, capitulated to Rome. But this geek over here and he's sneering at Trump. Right. He's sneering at Trump. And he has. And this is Francis. And he said, look, the United States needs to be overthrown and needs to be under control of the world in order to make sure that they become disarmed. And become a, a you know a proper member of what the Catholic Church, where the church gets rich and everybody else gets poor. Wow, mm. <sighs> the times that we live, and I think that even uh, you know expresses a, a greater urgency, Zen and Doctor Pigeon, for us to uh, figure these things out and to have the truth revealed to us, because it's the truth that sets us free. And as Doctor Pigeon has stated before, that liberty coming out of her includes the power of the system of this age, the influence of this age, which would include the Roman Reich or their influence over us as a people, that we would be delivered from those fetters mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and physically, and come into the knowledge of our true sovereign and under his provision and protection, which leads me, um, if I may then uh, transition quickly into uh, what Paul talks about regarding duality and why I think it's important for us to understand that it's not just embracing a particular tradition and thinking that it's harmless, although we do see, as Dr. Pigeon stated, we do see some of these roots tied into pagan uh, worship and uh, pagan traditions th in which they honored their gods, and they did so in ways that was um, sexually appealing. It was always hypersexualized, uh, which is related to the human nature of pleasure, and that's really what we're going to talk about. It really is uh, very sinister if you if you understand the psychology behind Christmas and Easter and these particular traditions. If you understand, there is a psychology behind them. And so we'll start here with um, the book of Romans, specifically chapter seven. Go ahead, Zen. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. 
go right ahead. Okay. So, yeah. so in chapter seven, um, and I would encourage you to read the entire chapter, but specifically in chapter verse 25, um, prior to that, uh, Paul compares the struggle of sin to a soul without restraint. And I'll explain that word soul in just a minute. But he is talking about the duplicity of his mind, that which he desires to do, he does not do, and what he does not want to do, he ends up doing. And so he's talking about this duality, right? Something that's existing inside of him. But he gives a credit to the fact that there is another law that's laboring on his behalf. One uh, where the mind can submit to and one where the flesh is being governed. So again, he compares the struggle of sin to a soul without restraint. And then he goes on to say that the spirit of the law, that is the spirit of Yahuwah's law that has been given to us, is then juxtaposed with the law of sin and death. So he shows a comparison there. And in verse 25, Paul concludes that the work of Yahusha has enabled him to serve the law of Elohim with his mind, while surrendering his flesh to the ordinance of sin, okay? So if we're going to talk about inheriting lies, uh, and some people want to say, well, it's superficial, like, like Dr. Pigeon suggested. It's not, that's not what it means to me. Well, if we think about the poor guy that reached out, what was his name, that reached out and touched the ark while they were transporting it from the Philistines back into the temple, what was his name? Um, Phineas. No. Phineas, yes. No, 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 nothing. He reached out, touched it, and, and Yahuwah, God struck him. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, I can't think of his name. Anyhow, if we think about that poor guy, well, I'm sure Yahuwah knew his heart. However, there was a pattern that there was a responsibility and accountability, and that, that, that guy knew better. He knew better than to touch the ark in a particular way. So, yes, Yah does know our heart. Yes, God knows our heart. However, once you become aware of something, once you know the truth, you're accountable to perform on that behalf, on behalf of the truth. And so, um, understanding then what it is that's actually ha happening when we continue to embrace these traditions and we don't sever them, uh, we don't sever ourselves from them. It's actually impeding sin upon the soul. It's defiling the soul, which is what Paul was talking about. I know in the Greek, in this verse, the Greek mind, that word mind is used. But if we were to look at that word mind, it's actually the word uh, suke or psyche in Latin. It's where we get the word uh, psychology, right? Psychic or psychology, suke. Uh, so in the Hebrew, we find uh, this word equivalent to the word nefesh or uh, also Neshama, I couldn't think of. I was like, Nefesh and Neshama. They're very similar to each other. But what's interesting, Zen, is that both of these words for soul, right, the soul of the man, thinking, okay, they're saying the mind is the psyche of the man. But again, the Hebrew equivalent is the soul of the man. So just think, the soul is the psyche, right? It's, it's the soul of the man. What is the soul in Hebrew, though? The soul, if we were to look at this word nefesh, is the source of life, but specifically the mind, the intellect, the seat of reasoning, and it is uh, considered to be the vital force of humanity, uh, even, even associated with the fire, the fire of the man, right, that which burns deeply within. It's also defined as the appetite because you would have a burning desire for something. So you can see how that relates. But if we were to look at Genesis, so in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, Yahuwah Elohim, it says that he formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then the man became a living soul. Then he became inspired by the breath of of God. He became alive or animated. So it's in this place that a man is inspired to do something. This is where he has thoughts and emotions. This is where he reasons. And even more than that, Zen, this is the place where he conspires to do a thing. And it's out of that place that behavior is brought forth or actions, right? So that's why the scripture tells us not to just be, don't be just a hearer of the word, but also a doer of the word. It, it really reflects what is governing the mind of the individual. This is why obedience is the byproduct of the ruach working inside of those of us who have been liberated by that truth. And so moving forward from that concept of psyche, understanding that the psychology of the enemy would then be able would be to control 
your behavior, right? To control your mind, this mind control, right? So it really is the enemy of this age, the powers of the air, right? The principalities of darkness that rule in the hearts of corrupt men to try to control the masses by manipulating their minds and thus producing behavior that is the antithesis to truth or works contrary to Yahuwah's reflecting in rebellion, right? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, yeah. it reminds me also of the whole theme of the fall of humanity. You know, the tree pleasant to the Absolutely. eyes, uh, a desire oh, yeah. to make one wise. And then the whole battle between carnality and spirituality, you know, and that aspect of how we're supposed to, um, instead of citing and identifying with the fe- with the flesh, we identify with cre- uh, Christ and the kingdom that is within us. That's what it means to be kingdom-minded or to have the mind of Mashiach, right? And we know that we're transformed by renewing our minds, so this makes sense. But I just wanted to clarify that the translation of that word for psyche or suke is mind, but in the Hebrew it's nefesh or soul. Okay, so well, I think that's... Well, ahead, let's, let's take a look at that for a second, Jessica. Well, let's look at it, Dr. It's, Key. It's the most <laughs> wonderful time of the year. It's the most expensive time of the year, if you it's ask me. It's the most <laughs> expensive time of the year. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you get this, you know, I I want to be able to get into this while we talk about this, Jessica. Let me get just get some of your reflection on some of this stuff, okay? When you take a song like that, right, uh, it's the most wonderful time of the year. You know, the advertisers break it out. And they just, you know, they crank it up, turn it on, and it starts coming at you night and day. I don't know when they begin, Halloween day, when they're done marketing Halloween, here comes the most wonderful time of the year. Here comes the most wonderful retail time of the year. Here comes the Macy's Day Parade, right? Right. Let's switch over and begin to think think about conspicuous consumerism. and. All that time that, uh, you know, and you need to recognize that this is the most wonderful time of the year. This is the most joyous time of the year. This is the best time of the year. This is the holy yeah. days that, you know, and of course, uh, you know, once again, here we are hinging our lives around uh, the celebration of the winter solstice and the recovery of the sun god. Well, I think that that comes later. Actually, the the commercializing of Christmas actually comes later. First, uh, you have to uh, sort of get the individuals to conform as a whole. And remember, Christmas wasn't very popular, especially here in the Americas, not until the 1800s when it was uh, introduced by uh, the German culture. But again, everything that Christmas is today, it wasn't back in the 1800s. So it's become popular it's become acceptable. Like I live here in Los Angeles in a neighborhood that is predominantly Asian. And it's interesting, regardless of whether they're first generation or third generation, uh, there's Christmas everywhere. I, I don't care where I can go into a store where they everything is in uh, Korean or Vietnamese or, uh, you know, whatever. And I go in this and they have Christmas trees and, you know, Noel. And, and I'm thinking to myself, are, th- are they doing that because of the social norms? in order to conform to the pressure or do they, are they Christian, you know, Korean Christians or, you know, Japanese or Chinese Christian, are they Christian? And so you really don't know. It's, it's interesting, but, but back to the, the concept that it is through this, uh, this assimilation, that's what's happening here. And most people, Dr. Pigeon don't realize that they are being impeded upon most people don't realize that they are actually uh, being manipulated in some sense and have seriously inherited lies and their soul. It is really afflicting the soul. The soul is not free. They think it's just Christmas, Dr. P, and that's why I think this element is so important. And that's why it's so hard for some people, guys, to let go because of this element here. So again, back to the idea of the soul, as Zen had mentioned in the garden this is exactly what's happening you see that even the creature in the garden was acting somewhat as a psychologist right he was getting into her mind he was getting into her thoughts persuading her through communication to perceive something as though it was despite the fact that it was not right yeah so she's, in fact, he's, when you yeah. go and you look at the feast of adam and eve that was traditionally on the 24th of december 
they would celebrate that by taking an evergreen tree and hanging apples from the tree, sure. like sure. it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Sure. And, and this was its celebration. And that knowledge of the tree of good and evil became lit up with candles and then electrified in the United States by the founder of, of General Electric. Right. 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 And so, you know, again, this this really is an infraction against the soul, guys. I, I can't I can't stress that more than I am. It's an infraction against the soul. And the enemy knows exactly what he's doing. So it's not just that, again, the lie, the elements of persuasion that we're working against, but it's that which impedes upon the soul debt, the debt, the infraction of the soul. So again, what is the soul if it's not that place of your emotions, your passions, your desires, your thoughts, your intellect, your reasoning? It's the seat of the individual with all of his ability to comprehend because Yahuwah has created us to be creative beings, to be into intelligent. And so a soul, the man's soul is compartmentalized into these segments with its thoughts, desires, etc., including fears and hopes and aspirations. And so this is why the enemy, again, is able to manipulate those elements. So uh, the will, the will of the man, all these emotions is better known to the ancient writer as the vital animated force. So these are the inspired elements of a man. So now, the powers of this world, Zen, this is why I brought this up, because I believe that the powers of this world, understanding behavior, uh, are able to then control the populace, especially when it comes to the organization of forming, uh, form, uh, forming civilizations. Now, I want to define that word civilization, if I can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just know that we're one minute out from break and so um really quickly and then we'll pick it up on the other side and you can go great you got in greater it. depth you got it so again if the enemy is trying to create a civilization then he would use these tactics to do so so civilization refers to the latin word civitas or city or community this is why the most basic definition of the word civilization is a society made up of cities or communities but Early in the development of the term, anthropologists and others used civilization and civilized society to differentiate between societies they found culturally superior and those they found culturally inferior, which they refer to as savage or barbaric. The term civilization was often applied in an ethnocentric way, with civilizations being considered morally good and culturally advanced, and other societies being morally wrong and backwards. Yeah, we see how they use that definition and distinction to, you know, set up caste systems. And Absolutely. To, there yeah. you go. So You're on we'll, it. Honor right, and we'll shame. Be, we'll be right back, everyone, for a second hour. You got it. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. Sacred Word Revealed comes to Atlanta, Georgia on March 27th through 29th, 2020. Purposed to reveal end times mysteries. To prepare the final generation, we must dawn the full armor of God featuring Zen Garcia Gary Wayne Stephen and Yana Ben Noon Dr. Stephen Pigeon Justin James Garcia Dr. Joy Pugh Rob Skiba Laurel Austin. Buy your tickets now at sacredwordrevealed.com.
Hello friends, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. Back for a wow. second hour, everybody. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is a Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio, and we have been talking in the background, as probably some of you have been listening and hearing, um, talking about just the repercussions of what is going on with the impeachment of Donald Trump. And um, Dr. P, if you would, can you share with the listening audience again just what you feel might be coming down the the pipe for, you know, as far as what's going on and where it could lead. Yeah, sure, Zen. Let me say this uh, to all, everyone who's listening now, uh, you know, my prayers are with all of you and uh, may you be blessed in the word of Yah and may you find comfort under his wings. But what is coming now is uh, really the destruction of the United States. And it, this has a strong historical precedent, uh, and it's quite similar to the destruction of the Western um, uh, Western Roman Empire that began in earnest around, uh, around 400 AD. And what happened was you had people who were uh, intent upon enshrining their own political power at the expense of the Western Empire. And that's what's going on here. Uh, Rome and Germany are going to consolidate in Europe at the expense of North America. And we have been Rome because we have been insufficient. We have been Rome because we have failed to assert ourselves. We have been Rome because we haven't read our scriptures. We have been Rome because we haven't studied our history. We have been Rome because we haven't honored our mother and our father. We did not do what our parents taught us to do when they founded this country. And they said, be this way. You know, when William Bradford set out the principles of the Mayflower Compact, we could have adhered to those and we didn't because we wanted to serve the flesh. And every year that went on, we served the flesh more and more and more. And we capitulated to the political authority of Rome, which is Germany. And we have become totally controlled by Germany, Rome slash Rome. Uh, you know, Rome, which is its political hand, its political hand is operated by what used to be the Third Reich, and it's now the Fourth Reich. And the Fourth Reich has been in full bloom in this country. And soon, very soon, we will have a Fourth Reich leader uh, running this country. Now, what I expressed to Jessica is that there's an orderly transition of power, but this orderly transition of power is not going to last very long, just as it didn't last long in the Weimar Republic, just as it didn't last long after the collapse of the Tsar in Russia prior to the Bolshevik Revolution. Instead, what will happen is we'll have an orderly transition for a short period of time. Whoever that person is that's put in power will try to do his best or her best to reconcile the country into unity. It will, it will utterly fail and there will be an acute and violent civil war. And from that, the most ruthless murderer you can imagine is going to be the one that is going to assert and take control. In other words, he who is willing to kill more than the next mm. guy will be the one who takes power. And ultimately, the cities will burn. And my guess is somewhere between 70 and 140 million people are going to die in this country. It's, it's going to be someone without compassion or tolerance and, you know, we talk about this often, Zen, on The Good Report, Dr. Pigeon and I, we talk about the condition of this world and, again, leads us right back to our topic, which is why it's so important for us to come out of her. And it's not just making the decision to cut these things off, but really having it rooted out. You have to cut it and lay the axe to the root. You got to lay the axe to the root. And you got to cut it from the depths of your soul. You have to be conformed to the truth. The truth will liberate you, set you free, and transform you. Uh, it's the only way I think that we're going to be able to endure what's coming. Uh, if our minds are stayed on him, if we're looking to the left and to the right, forget it. We're going to get a hook in our mouth, and we're doomed. 
And uh, but guess what? A remnant means one or two. Uh, we, he just needs a few faithful people who are willing to endure the trials and tribulations uh, and the testing and who were willing to be refined by fire and persecution and still, you know, held fast to him. So I believe that there are many of us, not just a few. I think there's many of us who are willing uh, to stand even in the face of adversity. So praise Yahuwah for his infinite mercy. We win, by the way. Oh, yeah. We win. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I do want to just share a little bit from the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. This is in the third protocol, uh, passage nine. It says, when the hour strikes for our sovereign Lord of all the world, to be crowned, it is these same hands which will sweep away everything that might be a hindrance there too. And we know that this is, you know, again, the biblical Antichrist, but in verse 11 it says, this hatred will be still further magnified by the effects of an economic crisis which will stop dealing on the exchanges and bring industry to a standstill. We shall create by all the secret subterranean methods open to us and with the aid of gold, which is all in our hands, a universal economic crisis whereby we shall throw upon the streets whole mobs of workers simultaneously in all the countries of Europe. I would extend that to the world. These mobs will rush delightedly to shed the blood of those whom in the simplicity of their ignorance they have envied from their cradles and whose property they will then be able to loot. Ours they will not touch because the moment of attack will be known to us and we shall take measures to protect our own. And so, you know, again, this is from the protocols. It's been long in writing that this has been planned, the orchestration of the economic crisis, the fall of America, they're bringing us to our knees, and also um, standing up the communist atheist powers of China and, um, and Russia. All that has been part of the process of you know, trying to weaken us as a nation in order to bring forth what would be the the new world order and world government as controlled by the elites and their, you know, the whole thing of the divine right uh, of kings and divine right to rule. Um, Dr. P? Yeah, I think that's right, Sen. And I think when you talk about these, these families doing this, you know, we can see as part of the protocol, the imposition of Islam. And, you know, there are literally hundreds of mosques going up in Canada and the United States and in Britain and all over Europe, as the Pope routinely tells Europeans just to embrace it. Uh, the, the prime minister of Austria tells the women in Austria to embrace being raped because that's part of the new culture. That's the way it is. And uh, so we have seen a capitulation really over to the darkest forces. And in the middle of this, I mean, I'm going to say this, you know, I have been working uh, diligently on uh, trying to put together uh, the formulation that would allow us to walk out of this death spiral, to walk out of this pact with death, to walk out of this suicide pact, which the Western countries have been in since World War II. And I can't imagine why this has happened. Uh, we, sh- we should have done something as a result of the victory. And instead of doing the right thing as a result of the victory, we instead went down the path of perversion, decadence, and defilement until we have arrived at a completely demoralized nation. And so when we talk about the restoration of morality, you know, the restoration of what we do, who we are, how we marry, how we bury, what we think, what we do culturally, this becomes the critical and most important question. And the average American says, my cultural values are based upon what TV tells me is the direction the fish swim up the wide stream. Therefore, if television embraces it, that's my morality. There is no question. There is no inquiry. There is no thought. There is no plan. There is no intellectualism. There is, it's just, 
this is what we do because this is what we do. And what we do and what we have done is has led us down a path of no moral backbone, no moral fortitude, no spiritual strength, no intellectual conviction, and no integrity. We have no culture remaining. We don't know who we are as a people. And all we do is getting together in a room and bicker about who should be chief. And that's the whole plan. Everybody is their own God. Everybody is their own judge. Everybody is their own authority. There is no homogeneity within American culture today. So you have churches fighting with each other, denominations fighting with each other. The Hebrew Roots community might as well be a physical midrash where people are punching each other in the face. I mean, it's there's division at every possible level. And of course, every day that goes by, people pour fuel on that fire to try to drive a wedge between this person, that person, this person, and the other person. And ultimately what we see is an inability to find the covenant, an inability to find the simplicity of Yahweh, an inability to see the markers of salvation, and an absolute blindness to the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Jessica? Well, I don't know what topic we're on anymore. So I was really, really trying to focus on the uh, the Christmas special because I think it's really important. Again, part of that element uh, being a crux in the soul. Did you did you want to s- keep talking about that? Or? Uh, let me well, let me bring up one are, last sir. point. Yeah, let okay. me bring up one last point, and then we'll go go back into that. Um, okay. And this is just you know from the the vision of Albert Pike where they saw and again. Uh, this coming forth in the late 1800s about the need to uh, foment three world wars as pretext to bring on this world government. It says, and, you know, again, the connection to the Antichrist and what I read from the protocols, we shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists and we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origin of savagery, and of the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere, the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization. And the multitude disillusioned with Christianity, whose deistic spirits will from that moment be without compass or direction, anxious for an idea, but without knowing where to render its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out in the public view. This manifestation will result from the general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. And so, you know, again, the whole thing with the New World Order, the one world government, one world economic system, one world religion, is they want to bring Satanism, Luciferism, the adoration of the Antichrist out into public view and make it the you know, the mark of the beast system. And so, I mean, they are not in any way trying to hide. And I think that the whole thing with uh, honoring pagan holidays and getting lost to the truth of, you know, the meaning and uh, the fulfillment prophetically of the Levitical feast days, uh, that that can help people to restore and to move away and to come out of her as we've been talking about this evening. So... Uh, back to you, Jessica. Yeah, Romans 6.23 says that the wages, the penalty for sin is death. And uh, you mentioned several times that this is their goal uh, uh, and that they're attempting to do these things. But as Dr. Pigeon mentioned, they have already accomplished it. 
that's that's my point here is that this this concept of soul, which we don't consider, uh, is probably the most valuable of all to them. Why? Because the soul is the foundation of the individual. It's the foundation of man. It's where that judgment seat, that bema seat exists. And so when judgment comes, it will come against the soul and the soul is being vexed. The, the soul will make will make payment, will make penance for these infractions. And so this is why I'm saying it's important that we understand how and vital it is for us to come out of her completely. And that means uh, the celebrations and the traditions of this world, the Roman influence of this world that keep people uh, segregated from the truth because it's the truth that sets us free. It says here, but the gift, the gift of Elohim is eternal life through Yeshua HaMashiach. Um, and so we know that there is a penalty for sin. That penalty is death. And we know that we will taste death in the natural, but what about the the eternal? There's a second death, right? And we know that uh, Dr. Pigeon was talking about those hedonistic tendencies that we're all sort of born with. It's intrinsic, and we're, we're we have this bend towards pleasure, which is why Christmas and Easter seem so attractive at times, especially when it incorporates family and presence and we get to dote on one another financially we get to buy it's not even about what we buy for the individual it's more of this honor and shame system that we are accustomed to which is what i mentioned before the break uh zen we were talking about that um that word civilization uh coming from the root word civitas uh or civil or city or community now remember that the idea is that you're either a civilized community uh meaning that you are advanced and you are considered superior or you are barbaric right you are savage and barbaric so these were the only two options when it came to differentiating people groups. That's it. You were either under the government of uh, the a rule of uh, an advanced government or you were not being governed. And remember, Paul initially spoke about a, uh, a basically a savage individual, someone who has a mind that's not governed. And then he talks about the government of Yahuwah or the law of Yahuwah governing the soul or the mind of the man. So, it's my belief, and uh, you know, from what I've studied, we live in an honor and shame society. And in Genesis 2:25, we know that the man and the woman man, uh, maintained an honorable position, in which they were both naked, but without shame. It says that they were without shame. Now, that word "ashamed" in the Bible in Hebrew is "bush," and it uh, is an external and subjective experience. It ranges from disgrace to guilt. Now, how many of you? have been, as children, both of you and myself included, have not only been parented uh, <laughs> with uh, with guilt, uh, but have also utilized this uh, to, you know, conform your children, to get them to do what you want. You, you know, or maybe women do this more than men, I don't know. But I'm sure if you experienced it from your mom, you know, oh, how could you leave me? <laughs> do this he, no, me. he knows when you've been bad or good. <laughs> right. That's exactly He knows it. when you've been bad or good. That's so exactly be good it. for goodness sake. <clears throat> That's right. That's exactly right. Listen, th again, this word ashamed, that's, it's, it's rooted in this concept because we have a relationship with a creator, a benevolent one at that. However, there are contingencies and uh, to, to our relationship, right? To live or to die, there are contingencies. And these contingencies have been corrupted by the powers that be Although uh, the reflection of that power is is within, you know, a man who stands as a president or a king, whatever the case may be, but we know that that that, that men's hearts can be corrupted, right? They can become, or they are wicked. And so in Exodus 32, 25, when Moses went down and he saw that the people were naked, it says that Aaron had made them naked unto their shame. So we see then that there is a position we can hold that defiles the soul or brings shame upon us. This is what I'm talking about. It's not just about the traditions, the pagan traditions that we need to let go of, but it really is about coming to a place of repentance where we recognize that the soul has been disgraced. The soul has been put to shame. And Yahuwah 
Bible is trying, I believe that the creator is trying to get us to a place, guys, because, you know, a place where we are free from these things, not because, you know, uh, he's offended by it. I'm sure he is, but not because he can't tolerate us, but simply because he wants us to hold a position of esteem because Yahusha has promised that in the latter days we shall do greater works. Well, how can we do greater works when our soul has been uh, fractured? When it's fractured, well, we're like a broken cistern. Let's talk about that for just a minute, Jessica, because I think when we talk about this Christmas expectation, let's get into it a little bit. You know, I mean, I used to be involved in this Christmas expectation. All right, let's don't make any bones about that. But, you know, this whole hype of, well, I'm going to get that for you for Christmas, right? You're telling your kids, you don't get anything all year long. You get it for Christmas, right? Yeah. And and then the idea of you know going into debt for Christmas. Don't forget to max out your credit cards. Yeah. Even though right now the, the cumulative debt of Americans is the highest it's ever been, yet the pressure is on going to debt for Christmas and get this and get that and get the other thing. And the pressure all comes down to buying of this cumulative set of gifts. And I want to just say this too. For those of you who think the reason for the season is Mashiach, then I suggest you watch Christmas Vacation you know, pull that out, get out the, uh, you know, the Chevy Chase and watch Christmas Vacation and recognize that there is not a single sacred thing anywhere in that movie. I mean, even to the point where they're going to pray over the food, they give the Pledge of Allegiance, right? But you have all the trappings. You have the tree and you have the lights and you have Santa outside and you have Frosty the Snowman and you have this, that, the other, the Christmas bonus, uh, the, the, you know, the friends coming in, but all of those things, none of it is sacred, not one aspect of it. And yeah. the expectation, the expectation that is put on Americans to perform for this particular season, for this particular ritual, in this particular way, none of which is sacred. None of which is they're, sacred. They're blinded again. It's 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 the it's the veiling, right? So the enemy, again, being a psychologist, understands this mode of conduct, this mode of behavior. He understands at least how the psyche, remember that word psyche, the soul. He understands how to entice the soul, how to veil the psyche or the id or the ego of man by appealing to his pleasure principle, by appealing to his hormones, by appealing to the feelings, by appealing. And how does he do this? This is so important. Well, that concept of good and bad, right and wrong, honor and shame, these are intrinsic motivators that either preserve or reform traditional norms. These norms Norms are equated with behavior and therefore help to fabricate the common thread of acceptance and tolerance. So if the enemy can basically motivate you to perform in a certain way and you're a leader, well, then guess what? You can influence other people. Now, okay. if the All popular right, vote, it. hang on, if the popular vote says, hey, we're going to behave this way, transgenderism is cool, it's acceptable, then it doesn't matter if 75% of the people are against it, they won't say anything. They won't do anything because the popular people have spoken. All right, now let's just take it right there for a second. Now, yeah, I, it's called social conformity. How, we've seen how the Christmas tree came over from Germany. We've seen how the license to sin came over from Germany, from the from the mouth of Martin Luther, and that how German control came into the United Kingdom with William and Mary of Orange in 1689. After that, after that, we get the Christmas tree. After that, we get Charles Dickens, right? We get Charles Dickens, and we get the we get Scrooge. You know, we get a different Scrooge every year, and the story is all the same. Scrooge is opposed to Christmas right, stuff. Exactly. Scrooge Perfect. is opposed to the gift giving. Scrooge, Scrooge is, a, is, a, is, you know, he doesn't Look like at Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. He right? was ostracized I, for being was, different. No yeah, one wants to be different, Doctor. No Richard. one wants to be different. You're the weirdo, <laughs> and right. Scrooge is a mean guy who needs right. to be. You know, he's shocked with three nightmares, and so we're told over and over again: conform, conform, conform. conform. That's don't right. be Grinch. Don't be Scrooge. That's it. Don't exactly. be this guy. Don't, you got don't be uh, whatever principles, convictions, integrity right. you may have had. That's get right. rid of that for purposes of this you see Roman it. heathen feast. Psychology. You see it. And guess what? All that stuff then is targeted 
who who's being targeted? The children, right? Absolutely. The children. Yeah. The children are being targeted because their minds are more impressionable. Their psyche, right, is more impressionable. It is psychology coming through that boob tube. It really is. Remember that tree worship was really, I mean, it was since the beginning of time they've been worshiping trees. I mean, whether it was the the Celtic people, the Canaanite religion, uh, the religion of Baal, the New England Puritans, I mean, whatever the case may be, they actually embrace Christmas. Christmas was sacred. It was sacred to the New England Puritans. Um, I mean, uh, here I have some notes. Uh, William Bradford, the governor at that time, wrote that he tried very hard to stamp out the pagan mockery of the observance, penalizing any frivolity. However, guess what? Little by little, there's an incorporation, and then they guess what? The, the, the influencers, the banker kings, right, the lizard kings, they recognize, oh, well, we can monetize. You see, that's what sin is. I told you earlier that the pagan Penalty, the payment for sin is death. You got to pay for it. So what do they do? They tax your debt. They tax your 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 sin. And so now you're not only you're not only uh, indebted, you're you're not only in debt, but you're now continuing that cycle of debt by teaching your children how to embrace these lies for the sake of pleasure, right? So we see, as Dr. Pigeon mentioned, the social patterns, and this is important because social patterns, basically engraved behavior, that's what we're talking about, behavior, right, is developed over time, right? People groups will share and pass down common social norms, while the development of a civilized society would therefore uh, require the exchange and application of information such that organized government, religion, economics, language, writing, mathematics, military power, all of these things being pertinent to the success of any society, right? So these things are passed down. Now, for a society to consider it advanced, well, can we transfer information? How well can we do that? And to how many people? That's why the United States is considered the most advanced, because of its what? Communication skills. Because of its ability to do what? To advertise, <laughs> to uh, advertise, uh, right. we have learned, we have some of the best advertising skills than all the, the third world countries, um, more impoverished, they cannot advertise. It's like word of mouth, but what do they care? Because like 20 people, that's not the majority. <laughs> but here we have Hollywood. We have Hollywood, guys. That's what this is all about. So our society, our society has advanced here in America because of our monetization and our advertising skills. Do you remember? Do you remember that movie in that show, um, Bewitched? Mm -hmm. Oh sure. Remember, she was a witch, right? And her husband was what? He was an advertisement right. salesman, right. right? And I used to wonder why. There's something there. Think about it, right? The sorcery behind media, right? Right. So we have. Remember, there's always been since like we can remember. There's always been a cultural tie between Europe and the Americas, and this is understandable, because why? Well, that's the Europeans that colonized North America and South America between the 16th and 18th centuries, right? Well, it's that influence. Uh, do you remember? I don't remember exactly when, but trees, again, weren't popular here. Christmas wasn't very popular. It was actually banned. It was illegal to practice, practice Christmas here in America for a specific time until the queen posted a picture again through advertisement posted a picture of her and her family standing next to a Christmas tree celebrating Christmas. Victoria. Yeah. That's right, Victoria, Queen Victoria, thank you. And it was right after then America said, bravo, bravo. And this spread like wildfire. Everybody wanted to be like the queen. You see, you have this social, that you nobody wants to be sent to the island of Patmos, man. No one wants to get exiled. No one wants to be excommunicated from the Hebrew roots community. Nobody wants to be shunned. This is the power of honor and shame. Okay. Again, Santa Claus knows it has a list when you've been good, when you've been bad, right? You get gifts if you've been good. You get coal if you've been bad. You see that? And then you have the element of life that really entertains the adult's psyche, right? That they are, you mix it in with Jesus Christ and his birth. And what they're celebrating is something that the pagans have celebrated since the beginning of time as well. The birth 
and the death and the resurrection of their gods. Birth was actually more substantial to their gods than it is to uh, Yahuwah, like to the Hebrew faith, uh, to the Israeli people. They didn't really celebrate births, uh, but this was something very common in pagan mythology. Births were everything. They had birth gods, <laughs> most of them female uh, deities, female goddesses uh, that would uh, assist in the birthing process, but birth was everything to the pagan gods. Yeah, huge. Anyhow, so the point being is that the sheer force, in my opinion, guys, the sheer force of social pressure is enough to reform even the most dogged rebel. Again, like I said, no one wants to be ostracized because remember, psychologically speaking, when you're ostracized, it doesn't just mean that you are sent out. What does it mean? It means death right? Anguish of the mind. Uh, you go crazy. I mean, you're going to die out there all alone, right? The wolves are going right. to get you. The monsters are going to get you. So that's the that's part of that tradition that has been embedded in the mind. That's part of the lie that if you stand alone, you're going to die. When I was in the church and I remember, I was like, I can't do this anymore. They're lying to me. I can't. And I, my pastor who used to be, you know, connected to the mafia, he, you know, I had to, I had to get like sort of jumped out my Pentecostal church. And I remember my pastor, I had to sit down and have this conference with him. And he said, I'm worried that you're going to die out there. And I, I, that stood with me for years, guys. Uh, I was like, what am I doing out here by myself? But I had to learn that, uh, Yahuwah is all, uh, you know, he's my strength. He's my, uh, he's going to be my protector, my provider, but back to the social norm and the psychology of Christmas and, and these traditions, um, gentlemen, although I'm sure we, we can access uh, any encyclopedia and any mythology book and understand that these things are corrupt. These things have nothing to do with the set apartness of Yahuwah, nor do they prophesy of the coming of our King, right? They have nothing to do with our faith. However, do we understand that what is, what is actually causing the individual to not be the fear, the anxiety, they don't want their families Right. If say I'm not I'm not celebrating Christmas this year. Well, what's going to happen? Family well, ostracize. Happen, yeah, the family will ostracize you. You could be left that. alone. And even people who are when you have family members that want to privately celebrate Christmas, they will just leave you alone. You know, bye. You know, you could be Scrooge over here. Lock lock yourself in your cold room and have a nightmare uh, because we're out of here. Right. Yeah. Who and, hasn't heard that? Are you a, are you in a cult? Who yeah, yeah, that, that's Come another on. one. Yeah, are you in a cult because you're not keeping Christmas and right. you know? Yeah. You're in a and cult. Of course, are you Jehovah's but, Witness? Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> but let's come back to this because I think it's very important. You know, when we talk, when we see what's happened today with the impeachment of the president, whether you agree with him or not, we are in a momentous time. We have what's going on is regicide, the killing of a president. We do it politically. We don't do it physically. Although sometimes it's done physically. But right now, this is regicide, and this regicide is designed by one faction of people in this country to overthrow the, in, the, the vote and the election of 63 million people who voted the other way. And so this promises to bring nothing but uh, tremendous destruction to a country that is already morally destroyed. Bankrupt. We're morally bankrupt. We've been morally defiled and yeah, morally destroyed for now for 50 years now. Here's the question, and this is the question I want to ask our listeners tonight. I think this is the most important part. At least for me, this is the most important message. You have to ask yourself the question, is there a morality that we can embrace? Is there a way of life that we can embrace? Is there a path that we can follow, a path of righteousness, a simple path, something that can be understood Something that doesn't require us to split our head open with a knife or beat our backs with a chain or tie barbed wire around our leg. But a, but a, an easy yoke, an easy burden, a light yoke that we can follow that will create a path of righteousness for us and allow us to define ourselves as a remnant people. Now, the answer is yes, there is. There is a remnant path. There is a remnant path. And this is the path of salvation. And this is the path that is going to be the path out of the wilderness, whether or not you're caught in this coming tribulation that is coming to the United States, this ferocious fire that is coming to the United States. As it gets here, you, you may be asking yourself the question, 
what can I do to get on that path? And what I'm saying to you now is that you, and this is the path I took when I was dealing with Christmas. First, I needed to embrace the biblical methodology. That is to say, I had to understand the feast days. You know, yeah. Paul talks about let no man judge you over meat and drink, over feast days, new moons and Sabbaths, new moons and Sabbaths. And so what you're talking about here is there is a whole pattern of life. Rosh Kodesh, you know, the new moon, Shabbat, maintaining the seventh day as a day of rest of the sabbatical year, the, the jubilee year, and the feast days of Yah, and not just the feast days, but also the fasting days, the days of fasting and recognition. You know, these things are all part of it too. And this rhythm of life is a rhythm of life. The calendar is a calendar of life because it's an agricultural calendar that teaches you when to plant, when to harvest, right? There is a time for every season, a time to plant, a time to harvest. This yeah. is what Solomon tells us. And when you sit here trapped into a, in an arbitrary Roman calendar that begins in the middle of the night on an arbitrarily fixed day that has nothing to do with anything other than Rome's control, you are not on a pathway of life. You are instead capitulating to a group of political people who want power for the sake of power. It's, it's what not are just you going this. to do to find your way out of that? Yes, and again, remember that compassion is required here, right? Go ahead, Zen, I know you, I'm sorry, I think I think I heard you interject. Uh, well, no, I was just saying that uh, absolutely, you know, um, deception on so many levels, uh, right. holy days being replaced by these pagan holidays and, um, and then, you know, again, when you don't look into the roots and right. you're complicit to uh, being involved in idolatry, whether unwittingly there it is. or not, you know, it. and so um, and that and even I mean, even to the point where you have Halloween being pushed yep. and celebrated in mainstream churches, all for the kids, you know, yep. you, and we were talking about how. Christmas and the gifts uh, that even parents that come to know different and better still they want to do it for their compromise. kids they, yeah to compromise to keep the traditions because it's all for the kids you know yeah. and, it's part of that so, social pressure remember children yeah, exactly, are more impressionable exactly. they're the ones that have to go to school mommy I don't want to be I don't want to go to school everybody else is wearing a costume Ugh. listen let me I, I'm I have I'm I have my notes I'm done here but let me I think this is important we have to understand what what are some of those external changes that need to take place as dr pigeon was saying but here are some of the trappings that have been laid for us and remember it's our soul that is captured by the net it's our soul that needs to be delivered and set free and it's not just saying I repent because remember you're going to go through this is how you go through it when you understand what is actually hooking you okay uh, and don't just do what you do because you're afraid of the consequences but when you understand when you're informed then you're empowered if yeah. I may uh, Zen I'll just conclude with this yes please okay so these are the various modes and you're going to see this and you're going to see it in a lot of holidays but let me just share some of these with you so these are the modes of of, uh, of uh, manipulation, okay? So you have external changes, which can lead to internal ones. So remember, if your environment changes and there's enough pressure, it will uh, force you to conform. Remember that, okay? So uh, popular consensus, those that will transform attitudes and views, which is why we live in a society today where it's okay for a man to lop off his uh, Christmas tree. Uh, external reinforcement. This includes incentive and reward. What you have here, and you can see this in many holidays, you have the increasing reward, which in psychology is called positive reinforcement. And then removing that is negative reinforcement. The same idea is uh, captured in the uh, idea that uh, Santa provides uh, gifts to those who are good and naughty, you know, that whole behavior right. modification, okay? Uh, this concept comes from the idea that Yahuwah himself, again, offers similar options to those who obey and do not. Uh, then you also have goal-directed behavior. 
What is the goal of the enemy? That's what we have to ask ourselves, which I believe is to provide a substitution. He himself being the anti-Mashiach, the substitution. In Romans 1, 18, 32, Paul describes this as a terrible exchange. Truth for lies, life for death, the worship of creation and the creature versus knowledge of the creator. Covert reinstatement. That's what's happening here, guys. This is a covert mental assault against the souls of men. There's a reinstatement here that teaches the person to generate and use pleasant images as a way to assist goal attainment. Now, guys, this is actual psychology. These are methods that psychologists use to help reform an individual or to transform behavior. And what do you think the enemy is doing? He's using covert uh, reinstatement, such as pleasant imagery, to help you reach his goal. Hello, which is to bring us to the place where we are today, which was Dr. Pigeon is saying is uh, imminent and coming to a future near you. In conclusion, we have punishment. Now, listen, this is not often used. We don't, uh, the enemy doesn't like to punish often because punishment can lead to rebellion. Okay, well, I'm not going to do that no more. And then you have uh, something called avoidance. Now, this one's the most difficult for people uh, when they are being cycle, uh, whatever you want to call it, captured uh, psychologically by the spirit of avoidance. When they avoid uh, the problem, it's a, a paradox because the reward includes avoiding the fear of being isolated, ostracism, ridicule, whatever it may be. And then it, uh, if you face it, then the punishment is that you're going to have to face that fear. You're going to know what your family's not going to come out. You're going to lose your children. They're going to whatever the fears. But guess what? Perfect fear casts out. I mean, perfect love casts out all fear. And finally, you have this extinction. So you got to remove those rewards, the pleasure, the lie that is attached to it, the 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 pleasure that you think that you are uh, gaining from uh, maintaining your position, uh, that has to be removed. Ultimately, it's got to stop. Remember in Matthew 15, 10 through 11, external things do not corrupt us. It's the inner man who's corrupted and then brings about these corruptions. So change involves, again, in, in conclusion, change involves that we repent, that we have a renewed mind, and that we be transformed in our actions, right? So that's what I'm saying here. It's not just about saying to your family, I'm not doing Christmas this year, but it's about coming to that place where you recognize that you are going to pay a price for the idolatry, as Zen said, the infraction. There is a great cost. And if you are likened to a broken cistern, imagine if you can't stand in the face of your own family's opposition, how are you going to stand in the face of, of the tribulation and the opposition that's coming against us that, who forget about it. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, transforming a, a carnal mind to a more spiritual one. We need to be transformed, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, we've got just about eight minutes remaining. And so I want to give both of you opportunity to just kind of speak to the listening audience as to how to kind of implement these changes into their lives and uh, how to go about, you know, just uh, even doing the research for themselves and why it's important. Dr. P. Well, you know, I mentioned it before, Zen, that you know, what I did was I incorporated uh, the holy things and then began to disincorporate the other things. And I pushed the other things out of my life. And for a lot of people, I mean, it's not an easy transition. Right. Of course, particularly when you're like, if you're a parent and, you know, you put up, you've been putting up the tree for years and all the kids and the grandkids are expecting to come out to your house and hang out under the tree and get the gifts and on and on and on and on. And that's kind of hard to sever. It's hard to do that. And similarly, if you're a parent, now, if you're a young parent and you and you just have young children, stay free of the tree at the outset. <laughs> Don't All bring right. the tree in. Don't bring the tree in. Stay free of the tree. Stay free of the lie that is Santa. You teach your kids to lie about Santa, and then they become to believe that God is a lie. Okay? Yeah. You lied to me about Santa. You're probably lying to me about Yah. And so as a consequence, you set the seed for an apostasy in your own children by telling them this myth of Santa. Now, so this is why if you're young, try to steer, steer clear of the tree. If you're, if you're a person who's been doing this in a tradition with your family for many, many years, 
they may not understand. And uh, and I can tell you whether they understand or not, there are certain things that happen. I mean, I still have difficulties with my own children in this regard, not radical difficulties because they know. And But I've come to them and said, look, there is no expectation of any Christmas gifts coming in my direction. And you have to recognize, don't have an expectation that I'm going to be sending you Christmas gifts. However, that doesn't mean I don't give gifts to my grandchildren or to my children. I buy them gifts all the time when I feel like buying them right. gifts. And so when it came time for my grandsons to have guitars, I bought them guitars because it was, in my opinion, they were ready for them. And it's the same thing if I want to buy a new watch for my wife or if I want to buy a coffee maker for my daughter sure. or if I want to buy a leather coat for my son. That's what I do. There's yeah. no saving up anything for Christmas. Yeah. I have the opportunity to do it and I do it. Now, it's not just gift giving to your own family, uh, but there's also generosity to those around us who are suffering. And this is something to give some serious consideration to. You know, my wife and I were downtown last weekend. And, you know, Seattle is full of homeless. And we're walking along, and here's a homeless guy standing there in the rain, in his socks, and he's screaming at another homeless guy who has stolen his shoes. Give me my shoes back. Give me my shoes back. You stole my shoes. And he's in the rain, right? Mm -hmm. And he's standing out there in his socks. And so finally, I just, I walked by him and I just said, I, you know, I can't do this. I can't do it. So I went back to him. I said, come here, you need some socks and you need some shoes. And so I handed him the money, go over there and buy some socks and shoes, go get some, you know? Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that there is something to be said for, and I'm yeah. not saying give to every beggar because there's a billion beggars right? yeah. and many of them are professionals. You have to use discretion. But I'll tell you, there is a point where we have to look around at those around us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, fully, I agree. Um, Jessica. All right. How many? How how long do we have? Oh, uh, six minutes. Okay, I'll go through this really quick. Um, I have a quote here from uh, Paulson. Paulson states in biblical anthropology that the heart, the mind, the soul, basically what uh, the conclusion we came to, has to do with man's relationship either to Elohim or to the nothingness of a false god. The gods of this world are vain shows that entertain the decaying flesh that maintain the void. That's so good. They maintain the void, guys. They keep you right. empty. Tillich believed that whatever concerns a man ultimately becomes good for uh, God for him. So in my opinion, it's really your, what the battle is that Paul was talking about earlier, that duplicity is the self-centered, right? The soul-centered is the same as self-centered, the self-centered, egotistical, hedonistic, pleasure, you know, seeking its soul uh, versus the Yah centered that finds true and genuine pleasure. Remember the woman, she ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because she thought it was pleasant to the eye. It entertained the idea of pleasure, but in fact brought forth death. You see the penalty for sin is death. So ultimately what you have to deal with is the mind, the soul. And the word tells us that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, by the water and the washing of his word, so that we can come into the mind of Mashiach. In my opinion, in order to be set free, especially as a counselor who has dealt m with many addictions, addictions, like Dr. Pitton said, incorporating change is also uh, very effective, but more than anything, having a, a genuine relationship with the truth. And as the love uh, grows, as that love grows inside of you, it will give you the boldness that you need to stand, to take a stand. And it, even if that stand is to take a stand, sometimes against your own family, yeah. you got to have that boldness. Yeah. yeah. To stand with truth and to stand with the most high. That's right. And, and the truth of his word. Uh, let me give you both a chance to share your website and your radio broadcasts and your contact information once more and where people can go to find and support your work. Jessica. Um, again, you guys, uh, you can find Dr. Pigeon and I on Crossing Over. 
uh, on YouTube, crossing over with Jessica Arianes. And Dr. Pigeon uh, usually presents on Thursdays at 5 p.m. Pacific. And then we have a show on Fridays called The Good Report that airs at uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time. And periodically I do shows with interviews on Sundays. Matter of fact, I think we had you last Sunday, uh, this Sunday, right? This Sunday that just passed. Mm -hmm, yeah. yeah, that was an excellent show. And I hope to have you on yes. uh, in the future. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It would be my pleasure. Uh, Dr. Pigeon, yourself and the work and Sefer and everything else. Sure. Yeah, the work that we do is behind me here, the Ed Sefer. And uh, the Ed Sefer is a comprehensive restoration of sacred scripture in the English language. And if you want to support our work, um, come and get a Sefer from us. I, I think you'll enjoy the book. You can also check out our library. We have a library of additional readings that are worth reviewing. And uh, in addition, we also have the book available as an app. Now we have been targeted, frankly, we've been targeted by Google and by YouTube. And they are assist systematically uh, doing what they can. Anyone who doesn't use the app, they're removing it from their Android. And they're doing it in droves. And we've been targeted, of course, by an algorithm. Uh, and I don't know why. I think I must have said something that offended somebody. But <laughs> at any rate, uh, you're... No, uh, not you. <laughs> iPhone, iPhone is having no problem with this. Hallelujah. May they be blessed. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, but you can still nonetheless download the app, uh, which is the 87 books plus the lexicon built in with a very robust search engine, note-taking capability, underlining capability, uh, and highlighting capabilities. So it makes for a lot of fun, particularly if you're using it with social media or anything else, you can get that. You can also get us uh, uh, as a free download on eSword. So come and visit us at sephir.net. Say hello, take a look and see, see what you like. We've got, uh, I have 350 blogs up. Our YouTube channel, Sephir Publishing Group, is also available. And Rex Harris and I are in the process of building Sephir Radio. And we think we may have gotten the bugs out. <laughs> All I have to do is get a few moments to try it, and then we'll have Sefer Radio up and running. Awesome. As awesome. A, Any um, other translation projects in the works or coming forth? At yes. We have a big project that we've spent the last 18 months on, which is the Sefer in the Spanish language. Awesome. And I've got to tell you, Zen, listen, we've, we're down to the final now. Uh, we've just had the preface uh, finalized. We're compiling the, the final of the book and we're preparing to print. We're in proofreading mode. And I'm telling you, it is magnificently beautiful. And the Sefer will include Jasher in the Spanish language, Enoch in the Spanish language, Jubilees in the Spanish language, Second Baruch, Fourth Ezra. All of those things that you find in the Sefer are all going to be in the Spanish language and meticulously word for word translated from the Sefer by our team of translators located in Texas, Florida, California, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, and even Spain and Britain. We've, awesome. we've used translators from all those areas, native speakers uh, who are brilliant, intelligent people. And one of your good friends, uh, Fernanda, is going to be taking over our uh, Spanish social media. So you can look for Fernanda at Sefer.net and uh, she's going to be bringing uh, a robust communication from Sefer Publishing Group to the Latino and Latina world. And may, uh, you know, bendicion is to mi amiga and mi amigos. Mm -hmm. Yes, be blessed in all things. And also one last thing I wanted to say about this particular show tonight. Don't forget to incorporate prayer into your life. Amen. Okay? And during this time of year, when you're worried about your family and so on and so forth, pray for your loved ones. Pray for your loved ones and pray for their understanding and also pray for their blessing. And, you know, that which you pray for will come back to you. Amen. Thank you both. I appreciate you. And thank you, listening audience, for tuning in. We will catch you next week. And also, don't forget, I'll be on later with Rob tonight midnight to 2 a.m. So it's going to be a busy one for me. Uh, we'll talk to both of you soon. Thank you again for your willingness. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Be blessed all. Good night. Bye. Shalom. Sacred Word Revealed comes to Atlanta, Georgia. 
on March 27th through 29th, 2020. Purposed to reveal end times mysteries. To prepare the final generation, we must don the full armor of God. Featuring Zen Garcia, Gary Wayne, Stephen and Yana Ben Noon, Dr. Stephen Pigeon, Justin James Garcia, Dr. Joy Pugh, Rob Skiba, Laurel Austin. Buy your tickets now at 